Manager Smoketown Elementary School at a time to be determined through the construction timeline of the CV facilities plan. Following a brief presentation by Dr. Sokoski, we will open the floor to public comment to specifically address the closure of Smoketown Elementary. The procedures are as follows. The Conestoga Valley School District is interested in receiving comments from residents who wish to express opinions about the closures. In order for the hearing to be of the greatest value and use to the board, the following procedures have been established for the public comment. Comments will be limited to three minutes per individual. To ensure that time is scheduled on the agenda for an individual comment, the presenter should sign their name on the register available at the beginning of the hearing. Is that in the back of the room? Science sheet should, should be back there. Any resident, taxpayer, or employee may submit written testimony regarding the pro proposed project no later than May 13th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Such written request or testimony shall include the name and address of the resident, taxpayer, or employee and be delivered to Denise Martin, Board Secretary, Conestega Valley School District Administration Building, 2110 Horseshoe Road, Lancaster, PA, 17601, or call her at 717-397-2421. Written testimony should include a description of the support or objection to the project. To be of benefit to the board, any written or verbal statements of objections should be followed by a viable alternative solution. The hearing has been scheduled to end by 7 p.m., but will extend until all testimony has been heard. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Zukowski, Conestoga Valley Superintendent. Thank you, Madam President. Per section 780 of the school code, we are to have this hearing. It's in the event of a permanent closing of a public school or substantially all of the school's facilities. And we must have it no less than three months prior to the decision of the board relating to the closing of the school. A little bit of background for you. At the February 20th, 2018 board meeting, the board unanimously approved the facilities plan, namely the construction of a new middle school with a 6-8 configuration going from the current 7-8, the move from Smoketown into the existing Gerald Huskin Middle School, and then renovations to Brownstown, Leola, and Fritz Elementary Schools, as well as the high school. As the district progresses with its plan, the current Smoketown Elementary School will no longer be needed. The date will be established pending implementation of the construction timeline. It's not gonna be closing this year. So I just want to get that out there. We will let you know well in advance when that time comes. The district has no plans for future use of the Smoketown Elementary Building, and as such, will close it upon completion of the construction timeline. <laughs> At this time, we'll open up the floor to any comments or questions about the closing of Smoketown Elementary at its due time. These are all brand new teachers ready to join in. Is there anyone signed in? Anyone signed in specifically for the comments? Anyone signed in specifically for the comments? No comments, Madam President. Is that it? We can conclude the hearing. If there are no comments, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you for your interest. <laughs> All right, the board meetings do not go that fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I found them. <laughs>
I'm sorry. Yes, Madam yes. President. That's okay. I'm calling to order the May 9th meeting of the Conestoga Valley Board of School Directors. Mrs. Martin, please report the attendance. Nine directors in attendance. And we uh, obviously have a quorum. Also in attendance are the superintendent and the administrative cabinet. Will you please join me in pledging the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is our work session, one of two meetings per month, month in which we receive most of the informational presentations as well as discuss and deliberate future decisions. There are also some action voting items required on timely issues or to meet time restraint deadlines. Our meetings observe the requirements of the school code, legislative directives, the original Act 84, the Sunshine Law, all subsequent amendments, judicial rulings, and our district policies to the best of our understanding and ability. All agendas and related public documents and details are posted on the district website. <clears throat> that said, um, I, I want to welcome uh, everyone who's come this evening, all of you, <laughs> who I suspect aren't going to stay all evening, as well as those who are joining us online. I would now uh, entertain motion to approve our agenda. Similar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any yeses or abstentions? If not, we'll move on to our first section and Dr. Zukolsky will introduce the first program. Yep. Um, thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Laura, I don't know if you're first or you're coming in second. Uh, we're coming in second. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn over then to Jay Grisafi. Jay is our transition programming teacher. And Jay, I'm going to I pull this up if you want to go ahead and sure. kind of introduce your, your folks, get with you. Yep, so I brought with me Melissa Garvey. Yeah. She's our IU13 job trainer. Um, she joins myself in the transition program uh, at CV High School, which we established last year. Some of you saw us last year when we presented about our program. And I also brought um, Derek McKenzie with me. <laughs> last, last year, uh, this past December, Dr. Smith approached me um, about some of our some needs to support the SOS group and they had some hiring challenges to fill some of the custodial needs in the building. Um, and he recognized, he knows the work that we do, a lot of the vocational instruction work that we do um, in our program. And he, had, he realized it was probably a natural fit for us to explore. So um, in December and January, um, February, um, we had several meetings um, with the transition team um, with high school administration, with SOS administration, and with district administration to look at how we can form a partnership that would be mutually beneficial uh, to, to everyone, to students, to the SOS group as well. Um, and it was quite clear that really what was needed was going to be a great fit for our kids to help with. Um, so what we did was we partnered, we developed a contract with the IE13 Job Training Services Program, uh, which Ms. Garvey was able to help us with. Um, to establish a program for student workers. Really, we, were, um, we established a program that's called the Student Trainee Program. Um, and within that program, Melissa and I work with students um, every day in the building. And I want to get ahead of myself. I'd like Mackenzie and Derek to share a little bit about what they do, what they've learned, and then we'll fill in some gaps after. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so our primary goals of the program, um, really a primary goal is selfishly is really the students, not SOS, but we're right. there for them too. But really it's to really um, teach our students some transferable soft skills within the school building. We do school-based and community-based vocational instruction. So this is school-based in the building, um, but also certainly it was to support the needs of the SOS group in the building as well. Um, so I wanted to ask these guys to share a little bit about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And we can talk about um, sort of the procedures that we go through, or, or what, what are we doing in the building, first of all? Um, so something we can do is we arrive on time, clock in with our ID, student ID, punch gloves and lanyard with a badge, stock our car, do our job, restock our car, and clock out. 
and some of the skills I am learning is communicating my coworkers and my teachers. Yeah, communication skills is a big one, absolutely. Derek, what are some of the, some a few examples of some of the jobs that we're doing yeah. in the high school building? Um, clean the window, mm -hmm. sweep stairs, wipe <coughs> doors, and vacuum. Right, we're getting into a lot of nooks and crannies in the building, right? Yes. Right, we focus a lot of entrances, yeah, entrances, stairwells, different things like that. So you're learning some of these skills to be like custodial skills, but you're also leading, learning soft skills. What's like some yeah. soft skills that you're learning about? Um, paying attention to details mm -hmm. to do the job right. Yeah, and I, these guys were an easy pet for, for us to bring because they really take one of the cool things that's really rewarding for us is to see how much pride they take in their work. Um, so you kind of right. see, and even as they walk through the building, I hear them saying things about, oh my gosh, can you see that person through trash? Can you believe that? So it's sort of like building a little bit, and not just from these guys, but from our other students. Um, we do have over 25 students who are doing, um, we do between one and three work shifts in a, class, in a day, and they're about an hour-ish hour, hour ballpark. Um, one of our goals is that we're working towards independence. So early on, we had to teach you guys every little step of the way, right? Yeah. Now we can just say, hey, Mackenzie, go load the cart, right? And you know what to do. Or I can say, Derek, I need you to get that area, get those steps, right? You know what yeah. to do now. So they're learning more independence. Now we're able to send students kind of independently through the halls. So, um, so far we've logged over two, 302 student hours. And this, by the way, is um, students are getting paid. So there is a stipend, an hourly stipend that students are earning paychecks. Um, so they get paychecks mailed home approximately every two weeks. So that's pretty cool for them to have that too. So um, the other part of the program that this could potentially link to is the, is the student employee program where students could get actually hired by SOS. We actually have one student who worked with us briefly in the trainee program who's already um, an employee of SOS now, he's a student, but he's also an employee after school. And I was gonna have Barb Missile um, talk about that program on this next slide. <laughs> Hi, I'm Barb Missile. Excuse me. Uh, I'm president and founder of SOS Group. We are really excited to participate in this partnership. We have done this in other districts. Uh, both my partner and I were administrators in school districts. I was a teacher, so we're all about the kids. So we're very excited about this program. Um, we've had eight students apply for after school um, employment. Four of them are engaged, two are currently working. One wants to wait till after school because they play some sports. And the fourth one is an onboarding that should be available in a day or two. So um, our employees are paid. They are paid slightly less than the regular employee because there are some responsibility restrictions. We're not asking them to run large equipment and that type of thing. And this is Carlos Dye. He is, um, are you supervising? I'm a custodial or? supervisor. Okay. <laughs> I should have but we depend on Carlos for everything. <laughs> so we can tell you a little bit about the students. We are hoping that the students that are employed now just keep right on going into the summer. And we would also, like in years past, we have spoken to the graduating class for the students who are not going to college and maybe either looking for a summer job or long term. So we're going to ask again to speak to that group. So um, we are very happy to look anywhere and get three employees. Um, <laughs> like Jason and Barb said, we have two students right now. Uh, Jordan Hoover came from the program with Jay. Uh, Jordan started off working three nights a week. Uh, he kind of ramped it up to five because uh, school was about to let out. So he's working three hours a night. Uh, and he came to the program. I talked to Jay and Mel almost every day or every other day. We communicate just to see uh, who we think would work great with us in the evening. Uh, Jordan's doing a fantastic job. Jay and I talked about it the other day. Uh, and I think the student program is helping us a lot. Uh, these guys helped us in the auditorium. It was uh, a group effort. They did a wonderful job. And I, I, I thank them because uh, without them, I don't think it would have gotten done because uh, we just didn't have time to do it during the day. But, it's been a great program, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing working with these guys. 
Any questions for for Jay or Barb or Carlos or the students? My only concern was I know when these sort of programs first started in other districts, there were some legitimate concerns. So it's just my hope that our students that are uh, taking this on are given the same respect as the regular employees. And I think one of the things that differentiates our program is, um, and I don't know the details of every school district yeah. and how the structure is, but I, my understanding is that at least a lot of them are after after school only based. Um, what Melissa and I are doing, it's all supervised within our program. So it's kind of nice that kids get a lot a, a lot more attention and uh, and training. And it's so far so good. We, we're getting a lot of compliments from staff and even some other students in the building. So it's been good. And Jay, just to have the, the two of them come in and speak in public is huge. You want to talk about soft skills. There's adults that can't do what you're doing, so congratulations. I, them, I get very nervous. Tell me nervous, and I'm nervous too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But well, we're, we we're understanding that it's a scary group of people. I <laughs> but thank you, but both of you, for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Kozer, our uh, assistant and superintendent for elementary uh, curriculum, who's on our next program. Good evening. We just thought this is a good time of year to hear for, from some six-year-olds about what is happening at Leola Elementary. So very excited to have Mrs. Erin Baer here, our first grade teacher at Leola. And her crew is going to share with you an awesome project that they've been working on in their classroom. So this is Neil. This is Madeline and Adeline, our rhyming <laughs> Um And yes, they are in my first grade class. And they were three of the key helpers to coming up with this project that was all student created. Um, it started with, a, we were reading, every Friday we read these scholastic news. And we were reading... Uh, Earth of Wonder, and it talked about ways to help our Earth. And then, Neil, if you want to tell about what Team Trees is. So for Team Trees, every dollar you donate is one new tree planted. And what about Team Seas? Team Seas, every dollar you donate, one pan of trash out of the ocean. Yeah, so they were really liking this idea, um, which I think they actually saw on YouTube with Mr. Beast. If anybody of you watch Mr. Beast at all, so they were all into it. Um, so then we were like, well, how, how are we going to earn money if we want to take part in this? And um, Maddie, you were already kind of into the bracelets, I think. A couple of the kids were already into making bracelets. So you want to tell them what our idea was, Natalie? What did we decide to make to sell? We decided to make bracelets, so then we would sell them for Team C's and Team Trees. Mm -hmm. So Adeline's going to hold up some samples here of what we created. So we started with just like simple ones, the rubber band bracelets. So so like simple ones like that. And then they started to get a little bit more fancy as we got better and better at them. And what's that one? Necklace. And necklace, yeah. And then even more fancy, they started to add, here, I'll, I'll trade you up add some beads and charms into them. Prices are going up here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we got like keychains. And this is the, what they call the professional one. <laughs> Rainbow coordinating beads. <laughs> so and they, the whole way, you know, they're asking good questions. Like, how are we going to let everybody know about this? How, you know, where are we going to set it up? When, when are we going to, they're going to come? So. We kind of worked as a team. Our student teacher, Adeline, pulled that up. My student teacher created these signs to put around the school. And then, Neil, what was another way that we let the, all the kids know? What did we hear in the morning? Announcements. We asked for them to put it on the announcements. And then, Maddie, what time of the day did we sell? How did we do that part? For um, sixth grade up to, so fourth grade up to sixth grade, they would sell in the afternoon because their special specials are in the morning. but. But fourth up to third grade would be in the morning. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, um, and then how do we set it up? We put it on like a, what was that thing? What color was it? Red. We had this, I found this red pocket chart that just kind of stood up on itself. So we lined them all up. You can actually turn the page. Oh, we have to backtrack. Well, we found out there are only four kids who knew how to make bracelets to start. So <laughs> those were our leaders. So I split them into little groups. And then you can see Madeline there teaching some kids and Adeline teaching some kids. And we practiced that a couple of days because it wasn't easy right away. And then if you want to turn again, there's some other groups. And you notice Neil, Neil didn't know how to make these until one of the leaders was helping him out with it. And now he's a pro now. So, and by the end, every single kid can make them. Some, some of them had different ways of doing it. I found little devices to help it to hurt their fingers. Um, so they got it by the end. All right, now turn. I had to go back a little bit. So there's the pocket chart thingy. And then, oh, what else do we have there with it? Anybody? Uh, what else do we put that one? We also put a cash register. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To keep our money in. And, oh, and what's also on the desk? Can you what's on the desk? Since the title. <coughs> What the presses are and what there is. Yep. And then how did we do it in the morning? Was I out there the whole time? Abby, Adeline? Was I out there the whole time? No. Yeah, we took turns. <laughs> I, I popped out every now and then, but I had to stay in the room to help the kids. So the certain kids, they took turns being in charge out there. Um, I'm not sure if we always got all the pricing right, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended on Friday, and you guys want to tell them how much was? Do one? Do you guys all know how much we made? Do you remember? I remember. Do one, do one, two, three, and then tell them. I'll say two. One, two, three. Three hundred and two dollars. Wow. <laughs> so we had a significant amount of donations from family as well, but um, I would say. Um, all but maybe forty to fifty dollars worth was purchased. So think how many bracelets that is. We sold them. The regular ones were how much? Remember? Regular ones were one dollar. You could get two for one dollar. Two for a dollar. So that's a lot of bracelets. <laughs> <laughs> they took them home. They took rubber bands home. Kids like that. I wasn't sure if they were going to come back. Actually, you know, remembered, did it themselves. Ooh. A lot of responsibility bringing those back in the next day to restock. We sold out a couple days as well. Taking any orders? <laughs> just, just on Friday, we were getting a little overwhelmed. <laughs> we're a little bit. Uh, oh, how are we deciding to do the money, like between Team Trees and Team Seeds? What did we decide? We have one big chunk of money. What are we going to do? Do it all to Team Seeds? What are we going to do, Neil? Split it. And what's half of 100, uh, 302? 151 and 151. He just said that in his head right now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a successful, fun project. Awesome. All on that. So, so. Uh, thank Excellent. Good job. Yeah. 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 Very good. Uh, <laughs> Superintendent's comments. Man, thank you, Madam President. Uh, we have two changes to the agenda that was posted on Friday. First, we deleted the agenda item regarding the transfer of files currently stored on microfiche. Yes, we still have files on microfiche. And um, Dr. Mann has been in contact with the vendor. We have a variety of file types, so the vendor needs time to provide a more accurate assessment. We're hoping to have that information ready for next week's meeting. And also on our three-page superintendent's report, the longest one I've had since in my tenure, we've added Heather Mitchell, a Juniata College graduate, and she's highlighted in red. We've added her to the list of Act 86 eligible substitutes. We have almost standing room only here because we've been very busy in hiring outstanding educators to join us to start the 22-23 school year. I want to give a huge shout out to the teacher leaders and administrators who started the interview process with the candidates and who sent me an all-star lineup from which to choose. I also want to take a moment, Maribel Fernandez, where's Maribel, in the back there. Maribel is our HR director, and she has been instrumental in the onboarding process from posting the job site to grabbing the um, applicants to getting them to the teacher leaders. And then once that's all done, I think every one of those people, raise your hand if you've met Maribel already, face-to-face -face new teachers to be. <laughs> we have a couple of them. The rest of you will after today. But again, a big thank you to Maribel for her work. 
I'm excited to introduce a number of our recommended candidates who are in attendance tonight so you can put a face to a name for these future Buckskins. I'll start at the elementary level. Haley Peachy. Haley, are you here? There she is. Haley's a former student teacher at Fritz Elementary. After earning her early childhood <coughs> education degree with honors from Millersville, she is currently a kindergarten teacher at Lafayette Elementary School in the school district of Lancaster. She'll be bringing her experience to the Viola staff as a kindergarten teacher. So welcome back, Haley. Thank you. Anything you'd like to say to the board? I'm uh, just so I'm glad to be back at CV. I'm a CV alumni, so it feels like home, so I'm glad to be back. All right, Marissa Grinder. Which, uh, which elementary school? She'll be going to uh, Leola. Leola. Okay, yep. Thanks. And Marissa. There's Marissa. Marissa is a definition of positive perseverance. She started her journey by earning a bachelor's degree in social work from Kutztown. She worked at the Boys and Girls Club of Lancaster before going back for her post-baccalaureate degree in early childhood from Millersville. While working at that, earning that degree, she also substituted, even took a long-term substitute position with CV to start this school year. She told me that when she walked into this boardroom, named after her grandfather, to accept the long-term substitute position, that she'd be back someday to accept the permanent teaching position. Well, today is that someday. So welcome, Marissa, back to CV. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, peer on, peer on me there. There you are. Emma is a graduate from Eastern Mennonite University in Virginia and is just finishing up her first year as a fourth grade teacher at Lancaster Mennonite School in New, Dan New Danville. Prior to that, Emma substituted as a paraprofessional Title I aide for Peckway Valley School District. That perspective, coupled with her teaching experience, makes her a positive addition as a year-long sub in a first-grade classroom at Fritz Elementary. Welcome to CV, Emma. Thank you. Angelica Fajardo, I know you're here. There you are. Angelica student taught with us in kindergarten at Brownstown. She'll be graduating from Millersville University with a bachelor's degree in early childhood education and a minor in integrative STEM methods. I was able to watch it, uh, do a student teacher observation and Angelica has got those kids not just thinking but doing. So I appreciate that, that STEM slant that you have. Angelica will be with us for the entire year as a long-term substitute filling in for teachers on sabbatical leave from the first ground class classrooms from Smoketown and Brownstown Elementary Schools. So, welcome. <coughs> Keep staying around, Angelica. <laughs> thank you. Josh Bailey. There is Josh. Josh has a bachelor's degree of fine arts, fine arts and art education from Kutztown University. We welcome him back to education. He's got a, a very interesting story, so when you have time, just pull him aside. Um, he worked as a museum director and then as a high school art teacher in York City and Lancaster. So you're thinking, there's no way he's going to be an elementary art teacher. Well, he's got a couple of young kids that have just turned his whole world around, and Josh will be joining the Leola Elementary staff as their art teacher. So welcome to CV, Josh. Gabby yeah. yeah, Versace. There's Gabby in the back. Gabby is finishing up her student teaching assignment at Fritz Elementary. She'll be earning her bachelor's degree in early childhood education with a minor in integrative STEM education methods. Mm -hmm. Gabby has also taken advantage of the Act 86 certification that we talked about. We added that one student teacher. Mm -hmm. Gabby's also substitute student te substitute teaching while student teaching. The Leola faculty is looking forward to welcoming her to their third grade team. Welcome, Gabby. Thank you. That's a lot of elementary side. Now middle school. John Skopansky. John is a Solanco graduate who earned his bachelor's degree in health and physical education from Westchester University and his master's in classroom technology from Wilkes University. He's actually being hired for two positions here at CV. You're like, how can he teach two classes? Well, let me tell you. He comes to us from Northeastern School District in York County and will be our middle school wellness teacher. And he's also our head varsity football coach, succeeding Coach Novak. John actually started his coaching career at, at CV as our defensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. So John, welcome back. Thank you very much. And Travis. Um, uh, Travis is an effort graduate, we won't hold that against him. 
who is dual certified in health and phys ed and secondary social studies. He earned his bachelor's degree in secondary education social studies from Delaware Valley University, and he's coming to us from over the mountain in Pine Grove Area School District, and will be joining Dr. Metzinger's middle school team as an eighth grade social studies teacher. Welcome, Travis. Thank you. Yeah, Travis came in interviewing for health and phys ed, and we're like, oh, social studies. <laughs> then I asked him which one, and he gave this passionate thing about health and phys ed. I said, no, now give me the same argument for social studies. That was actually better. <laughs> so we got him in the right place. <clears throat> Hannah Gaiman. There's Hannah. There's Hannah. Hannah comes to us fresh off a of student teaching experience at Mannheim Township Middle School. They all know what they lost. She will have earned her bachelor's degree in secondary education English from Millersville. And if you enjoy eating at the Utter Choice in Ephrata, you may have seen her. But I, I told her boss, her mom, because we did call her, um, Hannah won't be working there too long because she's joining the Buckskin family. Welcome, Hannah. At the middle school. And the last one at the middle school, Emily Heikenen. Emily, there's Emily. Emily's a Millersville University grad with a bachelor's degree in elementary education. Through Millersville, she also took advantage of the opportunity to study and teach abroad in Sweden. Ooh. <laughs> She's an experienced teacher serving students in both Pennsylvania and Maryland. She's also an Apple teacher certified and will be joining the sixth grade team as we open up our new middle school. So welcome, Emily. All right, we've got one high school teacher tonight, uh, William Bo Graber. Where's Bo? There he is. Bo earned his bachelor's degree in secondary education, mathematics. It's a great degree, Bo, from Penn State, and followed that up with a master's degree in assessment, curriculum, and teaching of STEM education from Millersville. So, for anyone who's ever asked why do we need to learn that math stuff, Head over to Bo's class next year and check out the application part of math through STEM problem solving. Welcome to CV, Bo. Given the quality of the candidates before you, I can say without question that the future of CV does indeed look bright. That's all for tonight, Madam President. Thank you. That, that, that was really exciting. And I think one of the things that impresses me most is that you're able to attract teachers from a variety of backgrounds variety of educational backgrounds uh, and while still keeping our, our CV feeling uh, we're able to, to take advantage of student teaching to actually see these teachers in action so we can pick the cream of the crop uh, bringing these people in from uh, all these different backgrounds stops us from being isolated stops us from being provincial but allows us to still stay, stay CV and I think that's to everybody's benefit uh, the next item is board comments, and I will start with one to announce that uh, while the, the board did have a retreat, we also had at the same time an executive session last Monday for personnel reasons. Any board members have comments about activities they've been involved with? If not, we will move on to public comments. Before we start that pending revision of policy 903, we no longer require presenters to state their address. Is there anyone who would like to address the board? That's for items on the agenda. Hmm? Items on the agenda. Yeah, well, for item. items on the agenda, I'm sorry. <clears throat> if not, then I need to say that and we can move on. Okay, and right on to our action discussion items. Dave, would you um, do the... Um... the uh, yep, the uh, approval of the superintendent's report. Again, because of the large number of people that we're hiring over the summer, we will be having... Um, Superintendent's report at every board meeting until August, <laughs> September, until we're done hiring these great people. Um, I, I'm really proud of, of the team that we have able, we've been able to hire early this year. It just seems we've got the quality people in, and again, the whole process has been very much appreciated. Do you want approval? Want I would like yes. approval, yes, sir. I move that we approve the superintendent's report. Second. Uh, could we please have a roll call vote? Mr. Benigno? Aye. Mr. Talley? Aye. Mrs. Kapka? Aye. Mr. Dillman? Aye. Mr. Gensel? Aye. Mr. Hurst? Aye. Dr. Martin? Aye. Ms. Trowbridge? Aye. Mrs. Brock? Aye. 
Yeah, Mrs. Heavily Flesher is going to bring us the news about where the budget stands right now. Nope, I missed one. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You are right. I did. I jumped ahead once. I knew I, I knew I did back to that happen. <laughs> Teresa Dreger, our Director of Food Services, has her budget to uh, present. All right. Okay. Teresa, just let me know when to go to the next slide. And okay. I'll press the Good evening. Thank you for allowing me the time. Okay. Every year I think food service, oh, this next year is going to be so easy. <laughs> and every yeah, we year. We think that too. Yeah, every year. No, it's, it's a challenge. So before I actually get into the 21 22, if you can indulge me a few minutes, because I know there's some newer board members, I'd like to go back to. March 13th, 2020, pandemic started. Because of that, our biggest challenge was, okay, how to feed the students. So thinking outside the box, I immediately knew I wanted to do a grab-and-go, drive-through pickup. So that's what we did. We persevered. We managed to get all that done. And um, what happened in Pennsylvania Department of Education, a PDE, they also came out at that time and moved us. You could go from National School Lunch Breakfast Program to the SEMA Summer Option. That also gave us a higher rate of reimbursement. Um, so we actually did that, and then they came out with a, a various waivers for different things. So then going to the next year, all right, we had every naturally, that year everyone was virtual at the end of the school year. So then coming back, still the pandemic, we continued with the SEMA Summer Option, and we had more students coming back to the building, but we still had quite a few virtual. So then again, the problem was, okay, where to feed the students? So again, thinking outside the box, we not only did bag breakfast and lunches, we continued with our grab-and-go drive-through uh, virtual students there. Then we fed through the cafeteria. We also fed in the gymnasium. We fed in the auditorium. You name it, we were feeding, I think, from it. So that was that year. We persevered and made it through there. So now we come to this school year, 21-22. Now the first slide I'd like to say, the picture on the left is our cooking club we're so proud of. We actually um, had um, was able to institute middle school this year. We did all the elementaries last year. So we actually have its four sessions. They do four different things. And uh, we continue to do that. Middle there is Smoketown Elementary. It's always a, a national breakfast and a national uh, lunch week. And Smoketown manager is fantastic. She goes all out. That's her, her board there. And the other side is the middle school young lady there. We actually had, I think, Mrs. Lefevre, a science teacher, come in, and there was a science uh, lesson taught that day. They were learning about different flour and how the yeast goes and won't break down in water. So that's those pictures. Next slide, please. Okay, now this year we continue to stay on seamless summer option. So because of that, um, and I'm also looking at coming through next year, Unfortunately, the waivers are discontinuing as of June 30th. So then we are being told by PDE that we will be going back to the National School Breakfast and School Lunch Program. So with this slide, I was just trying to show a little bit of comparison um, with that. Unfortunately, that means we'll be going back. There'll be no more free meals. Parents will have to fill out the meal benefit application, and that's going to be, you know, highly <clears throat> getting things out and trying to get them to, to sign those because then you'll have your paid for your reduced categories. Um, all students, again, if they come through with the different acts that they instituted, they receive a meal whether they have money in their account or not. So unfortunately, that's probably going to mean lunch charges accrued again for the uh, coming school year. We also, um, last year there was no CEP, which is community eligibility uh, provision, and that means if anyone uh, building or district-wide has a 40% of identified, your identified students or anyone that might have a direct certification at SNAP, TANF, it's uh, your, uh, your homeless, your migrants, that's the core group that they're looking at for that. Unfortunately, PDE had an extension. They didn't have really the information out. I think they have till June to get that out, but I called PDE, and unfortunately, as a district, we're just not quite there at 40%. So... And the next thing they always institute is a paid, whoops, paid lunch equity tool. In other words, that was the tool making sure um, the calculated meal price is necessary for the weighted average and we're not paying for, you know, the free and reduced, that the paid isn't paying for that. And at a current um, one for the 21-22, our, our price difference is $3.18. And as you can see, elementary is $2.50 and secondary is $2.65. 
and the 2223 mm -hmm. has not been out yet. So once mm -hmm. that comes out, we'll make sure we you know see that there. Um, and again, it, again, we have a lower reimbursement with the school lunch program compared to the seamless summer option. It's much higher. Next slide. Again, meal service in review. Um, we had the waivers continued our curbside, which I had already mentioned, um, July 1st. SSO, we also had, like I said, a real high, much higher reimbursement from the, the federal um, uh, department. And then March 1st, we actually instituted an after snack uh, program for the high school learning lab. And then our two audits that you have every five years were actually both this year. Our administrative review that has been accepted, we had the one correction there was we had that one blurb in the policy that we had to change. And uh, the procurement review, we're still, uh, everything has been submitted, but I had no response yet from them. So that's kind of still open yet. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Now, these are our, our served breakfasts, and we go back to the 1617, and you can see the biggest difference from 21 22, where, you know, we had you know, 11,000 were virtual, and we have 105,000 were in. And you can see the huge jump because of the waivers and everyone being free. Participation has picked up, and every month it just seemed to grow and grow, which is fantastic. A lot more students are getting those nutritious meals that need it. But unfortunately, with the waivers and things going away, again, it'll be meal benefit uh, applications filling in. Next slide. Same thing for our lunches. As you can see, it's, it was picking up um, way back when we had some problems with our paid lunch uh, students, and we actually worked to get that up, and we were doing fantastic. Pandemic struck, so we're still, you know, good at this point, but again, I'm just afraid participation may, may be a lot lower when we go back to a school lunch program. And then these are our, uh, our cooking clubs that the students uh, really like. And again, like I said, we had a, a middle school we instituted and we had anywhere. The first year, I think we maybe did 10 or 12. This year, we tried to do 14, 16. Some, some of them, we even had 18. Some students just came and you know, we had to get permission slips, but we did. So that was great there. And there's all cooking clubs. Okay. And then this slide here is really wonderful because we, you know, we don't know once they go home. The thing is to give them cooking skills and things to use at home. We try and put things on that you know they would have at home and can make. And this was actually, I believe, one of the uh, granddaughters that sent this a slide. Her grand uh, grandparent was uh, the granddaughter and her sister were there at home, and they actually made the Cajun chicken rice soup. So in, mm -hmm. we know that they are learning and paying attention, and that, that's great. You know, life skills there. Now, ongoing challenges is uh, certainly you know, replacing our uh, equipment that we have there. I know we have the uh, uh, district freezer that we're looking at trying to get the condenser and compressor unit because that's just constantly going down. Um, I have uh, student trays I need to get. High school, unfortunately, we did get some trays and we did get some uh, dinner plates in, but unfortunately with you know feeding, because even this year, for the, I'd say maybe, what, half, three quarters of the year, we were feeding secondary in the auditorium and in the cafeteria. But what's happening is the students were throwing, literally throwing our permanent wear away. They were finding, you know, plates. I mean, silverware you always lose, but, you know, the plates in our big trays and things, they were just actually going in the trash, unfortunately. So now I need to replace those. And technology said, too, like every year, I know things are on a, um, a cycle, replacing some of the monitors and our keypads for our um, point of sale, Mills Plus. We're looking at them, hoping to upgrade and do the high school. I'd like to get them a combi oven, since they're doing so many students there, and then a nice cold display cabinet to kind of, you know, spruce the, spruce the dining area up a little bit. And then certainly our construction pro our projects, just uh, renovating the the old elementary and the middle school, which eventually will turn into smoke town. And then my other challenges, again, as I stated, I'm afraid, you know, trying to get parents just to, I know that was in the past a problem, meal benefit application, the availability of the food and supplies, vendor delivery problems, and again, accruing the, uh, the charges. Slide. Initiatives, again, you know, continuing grab and go. Um, I'd like to hopefully possibly start up if we can again. It's so difficult there to get the 
get students when they're not in curriculum and construction instruction for starting up some committee meetings to get their feedback on our menus and things. Um, again, applying for any grants that might be out there and available, getting the marketing out there, um, uh, doing our, our farm to school, doing DOD, fresh uh, vegetables and things. And our biggest thing on there we're going to try and do, and I know uh, Mrs. Cozy there has either funds available or maybe a grant, I wasn't sure, but um, possibly instituting a summer cooking club. We're looking at doing it maybe the second, third week of June and uh, doing it Monday through Friday. And we're going to expand, taking the students that hopefully were already in the club. We send invitations out. So we're hoping to get maybe 12 of those back and just expanding on that, maybe doing sandwiches a day or soups a day and, and desserts. They always want to do baking. And unfortunately, on our regular club through the school day, we really don't have the time. But now we're looking at maybe 8.30 to 1.30 doing that and having them, you know, learn how to clean and everything, do the kind of whole thing for the day for the meal. So that's, we're looking at there. And I have a Red Rose meeting coming up with one legislators that's going to be there. So we always try and give them our input and our information there. So that's coming up too. So just good communication. Now, the um, food price outlook is terrible. <laughs> you know, as for going to the grocery stores, because <clears throat> that our main goal this year was, you know, what to feed the students, because that was our main problem this year. Um, most of the students were back in class. We had very few, as you can saw on that side, virtual. But our problem was, you know, what are we feeding them? It was time for school to open, and we did not get a delivery because of the labor shortages. They don't have the drivers. Well, then when they hired a few drivers, then they didn't have what they call the pickers, people to go and select to put the food on the truck to bring it to us. So we made an emergency menu, thank goodness, of our commodity uh, of food that we had there. And then it just continues to snowball. When you're at the grocery store, there, you know, you don't see things on the shelves. It's the same thing with here, you know, with food service. Manufacturers then decided, okay, well, we're making 20 products. We're going to go down to 10 products. They said it's easier to make, you know, one single donut than it is to make a small sleeve of donuts with four or six in. So that happened there. Then it, it, every month I was getting things saying, oh, this is discontinued, that's discontinued. And it's really, it's still difficult to find even just breakfast items because then it came through, okay, well, then this and this is better, but then, all right, then they don't have the labors at the, the manufacturing. Okay, well, then, then it was supplies. Then we couldn't get DART was discontinuing the styrofoam containers. And then, and then you heard, okay, well, then we can't get the place to cup for our cereal, or we can't get the foil for the top, or we can't get the foil for our Pop-Tarts. So we couldn't get Pop-Tarts in for so, for so long. So that was the biggest thing this year is, you know, what to feed the students. And then with the storing food costs, everything is just increasing astronomical. Um, I know we're paying about $12 in some cents more for a case of chicken. Our canned fruit went up $4.23. $4 and it's just on and on. We do a CAFCO bid, and we're a part of that, um, but unfortunately, again, every month, I was getting emails, you know, unfortunately, General Mills can't hold this, or Tyson can't hold that price, so it's just continual to go up. Okay. Now, I put this in. This was the last uh, information that I actually had for the paid lunch price report. Now, actually, as of today, there were some emails going back and forth, and I know um, Ephrata, I think, has uh, is going to do a 25 cent increase across board. Um, Cocalico, I think, was looking at possibly a 10 cents to a 25 cent. Peckway Valley, I know, is doing a 10 cents. We're <coughs> asking the board to approve. So we're slowly, unfortunately, having to do price increases because otherwise, even though we might have a healthy fund balance, and with your paid lunch equity, each year we do that, it continues to increase from our food service, or I'm sorry, our, our uh, food price, our meal price. And it's just going to go farther and farther and farther. So unfortunately, there are some, some districts, one or two said, no, they're not looking at this year, but um, they may, you know, maybe they have a higher percentage of paid students there and they might not have to increase it. But unfortunately, they came out with this paid lunch tool saying that, yes, okay, if it gets to this point, now we only have to do a minimum of 10 cents. But if you don't soon increase, it's just going to continue to go. And eventually, then you're either going to have to do a substantial increase or you'll have to do like every year an increase. And we had a healthy fund balance some time ago. And unfortunately, then we continued to lose, lose, lose. 
So then I think we did a 10 cent in 2016, 17, I think was our last increase. And we did a 10 cent and that was just for lunch. So, okay, 22, 23, concerns and recommendations. Um, I had asked, we were doing our Kafka bid, isn't, they were opening it up, but my meeting is until maybe another week or so. So I called the president and said, can you tell me, you know, what's the percentage? How, what are we looking at? How far from last year to this year? And uh, she said it's at least a 15 or 25 percent increase in food costs. And she said that's probably even way low because they were just starting to go through the bid at that time. Uh, and again, the paid lunch equity, free induced, is not subsidizing the cost of the paid meals. And our weighted average, again, is 318. Again, I just stated our, you know, our, our last increase was uh, 10 cents. And if we look at uh, 18 and 19 was our, our last actual information that we had for paid lunch meals. We served at 21,923. Meal served was 155,407 for lunch. So if you're looking at that and just taking that figure times your 10 cent increase, that would be the revenue, 17,733. 25 cents is 44,332. So I'm, I'm recommending tied into with the paid lunch, uh, a 25 cent increase across the board for both breakfast and lunch. And if we do that, I also have to look at faculty meals may have to be increased. And a la carte, with our you know increasing cost, we normally do cost plus to forty percent. So some of our a la carte, maybe our chips or ice cream, you know what have you, may have to also increase. Okay, so normally you get a Adele for the last two slides, so break it up a little bit so you don't have to listen to me twice. But uh, she's not able to be here, so. Um, I, I'm going to do these uh, these two slides uh, so that you have this on your agenda uh, next week uh, for approval of the price increase. Um, and on this slide, you can see uh, the projections for the current year versus the budget for next year. And it just illustrates what Teresa was explaining, which is we are going to have a profit this year, um, but that profit is really derived from the additional subsidy that we're getting for the increase in all the, the meals that are being served, and then that uh, federal uh, per meal price times each one of those meals is, is just generating a lot more uh, subsidy, um, which comes in obviously as revenue to us. Um, so then on the 22-23 budget side, um, you're seeing we're dropping that revenue off. And that goes back to what Teresa said about the waivers are going to go away. So we're going to need to go back to kind of the more traditional um, operations um, where, you know, full paid kids pay full. Um, you know, there are certain uh, student populations that pay either um, that pay a reduced rate or then uh, certainly some kids um, are at the free rate. Uh, so taking that revenue out and then we did build in uh, some additional expense, um, again, due to what Teresa was talking about with the uh, the supply costs. Um, you know, we heard the same message at our business managers meeting last week that it's going to be a 20 to 25 percent increase on a lot of those uh, food and supply items. As a matter of fact, there were a couple of items that were actually looking at a 50 percent increase. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's just going to be tough for us from a supply standpoint uh, in the regular budget, let alone um, in the food budget, which is, you know, obviously so driven um, with, with the food and uh, the supplies that they need to be able to um, paper products and things to run the operation. Uh, so if you go to the uh, the next slide, Dr. Z, um, it's a little bit small, but you can kind of see the, the budget. It's probably a little easier for you to see on your screen. Um, but if you look at the federal subsidy line, um, about halfway through that top revenue column, you can, or revenue row, uh, you can see uh, the increase there um, went up uh, by about $500,000 in 2021. And then again, a big jump. Um, when uh, we went into 2021, 20, 22, uh, again, due to, uh, due to the, the waivers. Uh, and then the reason it wasn't as high in 2021 um, is because we hadn't seen quite the explosion in the number of meals being served that we saw. So the two things coming together this year uh, really drove that number uh, much higher. And then on the expense side, uh, again, you, you can see where if you look at the big food item costs with the food and the milk and supplies, again, about halfway uh, through that section, you can see, you know, some years more than others, but, you know, kind of running in that $700,000 range um, up to uh, over a million uh, for this year. Um, and then we're projecting it to be very similar for next year uh, to everything we just described. Uh, so we are looking at um, projecting a deficit uh, for next year. 
Um, now, the deficit that we have there, the almost $200,000, would be without the 25% or 25 cent increase. Uh, so, uh, you know, as Teresa said, if we put that in place and uh, you know, raised another uh, $44,000, then certainly we're close to $150,000 deficit. Um, but, and we are in that going to um, uh, make sure that we do some of the equipment items that Teresa had talked about. You can see some of the capital purchases there. Uh, so we'll make sure we get some of the things in place that we need. Um, there were actually some other grant programs that came through. So we're actually, what you see there, the 58,000, <coughs> excuse me, is only part of it. Um, we're going to use some of the other uh, grant monies that came through to supplement and do some other equipment items for the cafeteria for next year. Uh, so if you have any questions on um, either uh, the budget or the program, um, please ask. This is the one time of year uh, we, we have Teresa come to the meeting so that if you have those questions, you can ask her directly. Do, do our parents know now what changes are coming? Not yet. They will. I'm working with Katie. Okay. Yeah. We put out we put out for the seniors first if they have any extra funds. She just put that today, and I have another letter that's going out this week that'll have everything listed to let them know that unfortunately, as of now, I know there's a senator that's uh, still fighting and trying to get something approved that you know it's universal meals for at least one more year, but it doesn't look that good. So. No, yeah. I'm just concerned that it, sometimes as hard as we try to do effective communication, it doesn't always get out there unless we do it multiple times, right. multiple ways. Right, yeah, we're going to do it. our parents to be blindsided. Website and robocall. Oh, Katie's good, yeah, she she yeah. helps me. So she's, yeah, we'll, we'll get it out there, put it on the website. And Buck's going to last. Would be good. Yeah, robocall. The, with the snow call would be good. That gets everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and once. You know, when we come back um, in the next meeting and once you approve um, the increase, if you approve the increase, then that sort of starts our sure, yeah. path forward to start making sure we get stuff out here. I mean, that's why we do this in May, not June, so we can get things out before the school year ends. Yeah. Um, and then we'll continue to just hit it hard over the summer and as, as the kids come back to school. Um, if you don't have any other questions for Teresa, I just want to say while Teresa is here that um, if we ever need an instructor in a classroom to talk about how to move on a dime, <laughs> <laughs> Teresa can, I, I mean, I, and I think Dr. Z will back me up. I don't know how many times I walked down to his office and said, well, now we have this problem. Well, now we got to do this. And now we got, he's like, what about, and I go, Teresa's got like three different options she's talking about. Like, you know, let, if she needs help, you know, she needs to let us know. Absolutely. Um, and she just has had this resiliency the last two years of every single time we got hit with something. You know, kids are going virtual. Can we do meal pickup? Can we do this? Oh, we don't have this supply. We can't get this thing. I, I, she's rewritten menus. She's gone to the store to pick <laughs> up stuff. I mean, whatever it takes to get the kids fed, Teresa has done it. And she's going to say, <laughs> before she said it, me. she's going to yeah. say it's not only her, it's a team effort. And it absolutely yes. is. Yeah. Um, we have a really great group of, of cafeteria folks um, led by six great managers right. um, in the buildings. Um, but I also know that that doesn't happen if the leader at the top isn't doing what she needs to do. So thank you to you for everything you've done. Thank and you. pass that along, make sure, to everybody else as well. We'll do. we got a great team. Oh. Is the uh, the capital is that in the budget, the, the repairs? Yep. Uh, I know we do our best, but I always worry about children who are in the classroom and not prepared to learn huh? because they haven't been fed properly. Yes. Yeah, that's going to be the, that's going to be her struggle next year is to get those people no, back to sign up again. They, they, yeah. they, they, I mean, they will they will get a meal no matter what. Yeah, they will right. get a meal, yeah. but then it, they don't, it'll just incur lunch charges. Yeah. So, Any questions? Thanks, Teresa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. <coughs> and now Phyllis Hall will be the more yeah. bad news. <laughs> nice. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so that was sort of, you know, a microcosm budget there. You got to see that. So now we're going to pull up and, uh, and go to the district-wide budget here. Uh, so we're going to start with, um, on the very first slide, taking a look at um, some of our revenue sources. And um, wanted to put this up here because um, if you would compare it to last year, what it really is illustrating is 
the green section on the left is showing a fairly dramatic increase um, of about 7% in federal funds. So this is what you're going to see. And if you look at the green bars on the right, you see $3 million and then another $4 million. And so each year going forward as this federal stimulus funds play through, you're going to see that green green section get larger. And, and I, I show that to you just so we know that at some point that money ends, and so then the green section has to get smaller. So what we're trying to do is, as we go through is prepare ourselves for that and make sure we have a, a plan for what's going forward. Within the local section, so it has decreased from about 75% to 70%, um, but just remember the thing that's really different about CV versus any of the other 15 districts in the county is that we are super focused um, at that local level um, on uh, commercial and industrial. So another district uh, might have maybe 20% in that bucket and 70% of the residential homeowner we have about 55% in the residential homeowner and more like 37 or 38% in that bucket. So they sort of both match to the same 93% of whatever that number is, um, but they come very differently. The other 15 schools look very cookie cutter and we look very different when you look at it that way. So to illustrate that point, if you go to the next slide, um, we'll dive into the taxable assessed value for a minute. And um, I, I did this a couple of years ago, and so I've just sort of been updating it. So each year that happens, I put the new year on, I drop the oldest year of the 10 years off, and I always take 2018 out because that was a reassessment year, so it makes the numbers look really squirrely. But if you look at that 10-year average, you can see that our, t our change, so it's percent change in taxable assessed value, we are not growing. So we can look at all the great things that are going out um, on 30 or maybe in Greenfield or Tanger, but all of that is not keeping up with all the things that we're losing along the way. Uh, so when I ran this for you last year, we were almost at the, the 0 0.20 mark. We're down just over the 0 0.10 mark. Um, so adding that new year and dropping that, that old year off definitely actually decreased that number. So it looks a, a little worse than it did last year. The next one then um, talks about our millage rate. So, you know, millage rate can get confusing to people. Like, what does that really, you know, what does it really mean? What does it really talk about? I actually like to focus on this thing that's called equalized mills because what it's intended to do I mean, the calculation is there for you, you can sort of read it, but what it's intended to do is say, when you compare districts, what does a, a, an assessed value package look like in one district compared to another district? So it's a way to compare it from an apples to apples perspective when you know that you have, as I said earlier, one district who maybe is super weighted to commercial industrial, where another district is weighted more towards residential. So it, it essentially equalizes it. Um, so you can sort of compare districts. I'm only showing you the Lancaster County uh, districts that we're comparing, but you could actually pull this chart up and compare any of the 500 or all of the 500 across the state, and it would show you where we fit in. I show you the local numbers just so you can see that even though it feels like uh, taxes keep going up, and they have. I mean, that's that's a true statement. They do go up. Um, that we have maintained our place uh, since I've been here, and I, Mrs. Graff could tell you better than I could how long before I've been here. Um, we have had this spot at third from the bottom in um, the amount um, that we rely on our tax base um, to cover our expenses. So it it just an illustration of where we are, and that the, the our spot has not moved. Then moving to the expense side of, of the budget, um, when we first talked about the budget back in you know December, January, I told you there were a couple of major factors that were affecting the budget. If you just look at the five-year projection spreadsheet that I show you, um, you can see that you know we're in a service-based industry, right? So um, the teachers are the most important thing to us because we need them to do what we do. Uh, so salary and benefits is going to be the biggest portion of that. And then outside of that, um, our next biggest component um, is going to be our debt service. So we're going to kind of focus on those two things because they're the um, obviously the largest factors. Within the staffing component, certainly salaries um, are a big number, but those are contractually uh, obligated, and so you know they are what they are. 
Outside of those, the two factors that affect our staffing numbers are health care and the retirement system. So this first chart is a chart that I've shown you before that just shows um, what the health care system looks like. We did change the plan um, back in 1516. So you can see what the old projection would have been had we not changed that plan and sort of what it looks like going forward. I will tell you that the projection in those out five years are based upon an 8% trend. And this year, going into 22-23, we're looking at a 13% increase. Uh, so that number is not moving in our favor. Um, so that, that's become difficult. The last two years, we've seen significant increases uh, in health care. And we're self-insured, uh, which means uh, you know we don't just buy an insurance package um, from uh, one of the big uh, insurers. So we actually pay for the administration, and then we are paying for the actual claims that come in. Uh, so those are real numbers. They're not like actuary or amortized or anything like that. They're actually the real numbers that we're seeing. The next slide then shows you the retirement costs. Um, and the retirement costs, again, are the other big factor. You can just see the growth there. Um, on the prior chart, we've kind of shown you um, year 2012 to 2013 up to current was showing moving from about 4 million to 7 million, so about 3 million over that period. This one obviously looks a lot worse. You're looking at moving from around 3 million in 2013 up to almost 11 million. It's like 10.8 million for next year. Um, so again, when we say to ourselves, why do taxes keep going up? Well, that's a you know an eight million dollar increase over ten years that we've had to fit into the budget um, without. Uh, now we do get state reimbursement fifty percent for this, but it's still five million dollars that we've had to put in into the budget to to make it all happen. Uh, so that just illustrates those costs. Then the next one uh, shows you. So I just want to touch on this cyber charter one because I know Dr. Mann had mentioned it before, and we went back uh, in one of our prior presentations and we went back and looked at our projection numbers because um, I think the last time I had said to you when we looked at 2021, we knew we had a lot of kids uh, that were in cyber school and we knew that that 1.3 million was high. We were hoping that it was going to come down this year, down a little more next year, and we'd sort of we didn't. I don't think we ever thought we'd get back to the six to 700,000 we were in uh, 18 and 19, but at least if we could get closer in that direction and um, just confirming to you that number is not moving um, for us. So um, we definitely need to, to, to keep those expenses in the budget uh, to fund those services. And then the last one, I, as I said, the other really big component, if you're just looking at total dollar amounts in our budget is debt service. Um, after Scott was here, and um, you know, had uh, had Tim with him, and you approved the bond issue, uh, which Scott will be here next Monday to give you the results of that. Uh, normally, when he does that, um, I ask him not just to show you how our deal went, but compare it to some other deals in the market, so you get a good uh, flavor for you know how we how we came out. Um, but we did get that debt issued. The rates were favor favorable to us to do it, and we got some additional benefits. Um, that were able to be uh, to be negotiated as as part of that package, and I don't want to steal his thunder, so you can talk about that next week. But I did ask Ali to update this chart um, so that you could see um, the full in debt service of everything that we have borrowed at this point. And you will see a little bit of a bump there in the next couple of years, and and I'll talk um, in a couple of slides about how we're gonna gonna deal with that and then get to our our level debt service going forward. So for the 22-23 budget, then. Um, next slide is the timeline. You know where we are. Um, we're giving you, oops, we, we're giving you the uh, the preview of the budget. Your job next week will be to adopt the proposed final budget. Uh, so we will come back to you next week with everything um, that you saw in the five year projections on that PD 2028 form. Um, Adele and I usually work on a nice narrative um, that goes with it, which is a, a written document, obviously, and um, that can sort of be like your, you know, you church or the grocery store or the gas station or wherever people stop you and say, why is CB doing X, Y, and Z? That'll be your couple of pages to refer to uh, to help carry that message. Next slide, Dr. Z, then just a, a recapitulation of what, where the index is. Uh, so the way we have the budget structured right now is with the new rate of 14.966. We are not proposing um, using the exception. So um, certainly that would be an option, um, but 
four percent um, is probably too high for our liking and I'm sure too high for yours so uh, we're going to try to do all this within the index this year the next slide then um, goes into the budget summary so this is the slide that I showed you uh, it back in April uh, so just kind of where we let where we started where we got to um, and then as we move through the next couple of slides we'll show you where we are now so some additional changes um, that we made since April uh, that looks like a really big number in interest earnings and you're probably thinking wow did we like miss miss something there no we borrowed 44 million dollars is what we did so mm -hmm. We know that the, the portion of that, there's a small portion of that 44 million that we're going to need to use for the existing middle school renovation, um, but some of the money that we already have borrowed is also gonna be used for that project. So since we've now pushed Leola um, for a year, we will now be sitting on a, a decent chunk of that 44 million um, for 18 months to two years before we have to touch it. That is good for us from an interest earning standpoint um, because what we have seen is that as short term rates have gone up, not good for all of us as, uh, as you know, folks trying to, to do things, or maybe it, maybe it is if you're trying to invest it, but if you're trying to borrow, uh, rates going up is, is not a good thing, but those uh, Fed increases on the interest rates will help us in that we can invest that money and then sit on it for a little bit and it'll spin off some interest earnings for us. State subsidies, um, we adjusted there. I mentioned to you before, that, and, and I'm still a little uncomfortable with this number. We don't know what is happening uh, with the state budget. You know, there was like a billion put in. Um, nearest I can tell is it might be around half of that number, uh, which, uh, so we just based it off of what we, uh, the increase we got last year. So if you remember, we came back uh, to you late in the process last year, those of you who are here, and um, we were able to put about $550,000 um, in as state revenue, uh, so, you know, revenue to us through state subsidies. And so we essentially took that same 500 and added it in again for this year. So we are at, a, at about a $550,000 increase um, there as well. Uh, and then an adjustment for transportation, the transportation index went up, which drives that subsidy as well. I'm gonna skip the retirement one because it's related to the first one under salaries and benefits. And so the salary and benefits number and the purchase services number and that retirement um, number up in the revenue all sort of go together. So when we went back through and looked at all of our staffing numbers, there were some things that needed to be added, some things that needed to be subtracted. Uh, and one of the other things that we did go ahead and put into this budget was um, we have needed, so if you remember, SOS came to the board um, in October uh, with a plan to do some pay adjustments, starting pay adjustments for the SOS staff. Um, we had not done it for our own staff at that point. Um, now, that doesn't include the, the teachers. This is the 50-some, 50, 50 to 60-some support staff and specialists that, that we um, hire directly. And so that part of that plan is to do an adjustment uh, for those folks um, to try to kind of get them up to par with inflation. And we're, and we're seeing it. We've had some uh, folks leave, and as we've tried to hire people, um, that we're just going to have to pay more than what the current structure was that's in place for that. So all of those adjustments, um, you know, kind of come together, um, but overall it's a negative number. So we were able to take some expense out of the budget there. Uh, the track we had talked to you about before, we went ahead and pulled that out. Um, we're going to do that out of capital. Um, on one hand, I want to retain as much of the capital as we have so that as we get to those future projects, we have that money. But in this particular case, if you looked at the spreadsheet that I sent you, you see that we're going to end, we're projecting to end this year a little better than we had anticipated. And so the plan would be that even though we're going to move the track over there at the end of this year, if that all comes to fruition, we'll do a transfer to capital to basically match that maybe a little bit more give ourselves a little wiggle room and then so it'll kind of be going in and coming out but it'll give us some relief in this budget and then the last piece is the debt service so again we borrowed the 44 million so we had to put the debt service in place um, and when I showed you that bar chart and showed you those couple of years where it's going to go up how we're actually going to fund that is going to be a combination of the interest earnings that we're going to earn so we're going to kind of bank that put that away and that's going to take a big chunk of it 
Um, and then when I get to the fund balance slide, I will show you where we actually had put some fund balance set aside to be able to help us if we were ever in a situation where we had some years when we kind of don't quite have enough millage in the budget to, to get our mortgage payment paid. Um, and I'll show you that number and you can see how it affects that as well. So then the next slide again, repeat. So on the left, you see the April uh, 19th numbers, which matches what I had just shown you on slide 12. On the right, then you see today, um, which we're showing you where we are. Now these numbers look a little bit different because I, I don't, they're without the Act 1 index in them. So I kind of wanted you to see what the true number was. Uh, so just about a $2 million deficit. And then Dr. Z, if you flip to the next one, we'll show you kind of how, how that what happens once you put the um, Act 1 index against that? So 1.6 million gets us down to just under a million dollars, 901,000. Um, we are, and we've been talking about this since the beginning, using some retirement and healthcare escrows, which is fund balance, um, to cover 600,000 of it. And then as I had just mentioned, we're gonna pull about 300,000 out of one of our um, fund balance line items for out of one of our line items uh, fund balance for debt service and cover the rest of it. So structurally, we are not balanced. This is not a, oops, we're only off by $30,000. We're actually off by like a $1,030,000. Um, but I, I feel like this is planned use of fund balance. You know, fund balance is one of those things where you want to have enough of it. I'm a little more comfortable now because we've issued most of the debt. So the credit rating agencies keep asking me like, how are you using this? Are you being thoughtful about it? Are you planning it? And so we've had uh, these plans in place for how to how to use it. And so I, really, I think what they look for is have you do you have that thought process in place? Not are you using it, but are you using it not to just cover operating expenses, which is the huge red flag that they look for. Uh, so it does take, um, this budget would take uh, currently, as it stands, uh, the taxes uh, to the allowable index, but it doesn't uh, use any exceptions. The next couple of slides, and I'm not going to go through individually, they're there for your benefit. Board members in the past have asked, okay, it's great, you kind of told me what you cut, but I don't really understand. Like I heard Joshua, I heard Ken back in uh, in December or Joshua in January, and I don't remember what's in and what's out. And the you know, staffing's probably a little easier because Dr. Z just did it last month. Um, but you can kind of look through those slides at your leisure. If you have any questions, you can you can let us know. Um, but shows you what's in in technology, what's in in maintenance, um, what's in in staffing. The only thing, uh, Dr. Z, if we could go back just one slide. The only thing I did um, add to Dr. Z slide from last month is there were some kind of other. Um, you know, we were really focused on the professional staff last month and there were some other positions um, that have kind of come along and so I wanted to make sure that they're captured there so that's the, the complete list. And then uh, I mentioned the fund balances so if you look at that savings from we have actually two that are related to debt service. Um, I should actually do them in the order they're on the slide, right? So the first one is future debt service obligations, which is a million eight. And then three down from that is the savings from bond refinancing. If you remember in the past, um, that was about a 450 or $60,000 number. So taking that 330 out still leaves us with about $130,000. Um, but again, if you remember that bar chart in a couple of years, we're going to need it. So our thought would be, Whatever we don't spin off in interest earnings, we'll come back to one of these two buckets and we'll try to, you know, layer it in as best we can until we get to, to the level debt service. And then the last uh, piece that we focus on is the, is the cost to the homeowner. So it shows you what the uh, increase would be um, at the 3.4% index. Um, and one thing that I, I probably should have covered a little bit uh, um, in more detail earlier, but I'll do it here because it fits is if you noticed on um, the spreadsheet that I send, the five-year projection that I send with this, you will notice that the real estate number and there's an offset um, that is property tax revenue that we get from the state, it's basically a subsidy, that those two numbers were highlighted and it's because it changed. So for the first year, and I can't tell you how many years, um, there is a May 1st date at which the state has to certify to us what it's basically the gambling proceeds, what the gambling proceeds are. And when that number came out and we all business managers, we all start looking at our number, all of our numbers are higher. We're like, what's going on? 
Well, the state fully funded it at the maximum this year. So it generated about another $190,000 in revenue to us. But I don't get to just put that 190000 in the budget. I actually have to offset the real estate tax with it. So what that means is, in, in this scenario, even though taxes would be going up at a 3.4% index, when a local taxpayer, any of us look at our tax bills, we're actually going to see an offset that's greater than we've seen in any number of years because we're now using that money um, against that real estate number. Uh, so uh, again, about a, a hundred and ninety thousand, um, you know, over. I think we have about eleven thousand uh, properties um, in the district. So it kind of gives you an, an idea of of where we would be. Um, the whole boat, the whole eight hundred and ninety eight thousand um, would be about eighty dollars. You know, eighty eighty eight dollars. Um, so you can, you know, kind of gives you gives you a gauge there. Um, so just wanted to to explain uh, that as well. All right. And then um, just the, cost, the Act 1 index is in there. Uh, and then I'll stop with, uh, if you have any questions, um, I did at the very end um, put some slides on the ESSER funds. And some of these are repeats um, from what you have, have seen um, before. Um, but where we go from here, there are certainly still some unanswered questions. As I mentioned, we don't know what the Commonwealth is going to do, and that's really a wild card. Um, so I could come back to you and say, hey, that 550 I put in was like, oop, it's only 350, and so now we sort of have to scramble. My hope is that I, got, I was conservative about it, and it'll come back, and maybe it'll be 750, and then, um, you know, we can maybe back off the 3.4% a little bit or what it may, you know, whatever other ideas you have, but I'm hoping to have that number before June. And then, um, as Teresa mentioned, not only will she come back, we'll come back with the CAFCO bids. We actually do a number of our bids through a consortia at the IU, and um, those were those price increases I mentioned. So as we see how that plays out, um, you know, we'll be able to have some some better numbers there as well. Um, to, to share with you going forward. So let me stop there um, and see if you have any questions um, before we get to the ESSER piece. Just so everyone understands that uh, the money from the gambling that comes to us, <clears throat> that's not taking off your tax bill, that's taking off your assessment before the tax is calculated. Correct. Before somebody thinks that's actually money coming off your tax bill. <laughs> Right. Well, your well, tax bill effect, will actually be less because it it'll come off of the bill, assessed value of the property. Yes. Off of, you know, yes. What that calculation was. Uh, and I will get back to you because I did not have time to do this in advance, but I'd appreciate if you would take a look at some point uh, as your five-year um, projection between 22-23 between budget and 23-24 projection. You have expenses going down, but I couldn't find a line item to explain it. Okay, 22, 23, yeah. budget. Uh, I found a, a $20 reduction okay. and a $257,000 reduction. Okay. All right. But at yeah. the end uh, of the column, the reduction is $3 million, and I'm not sure I understand how that calculation. Sure, yep. <laughs> but I'm not going to take up time tonight. No, but we can definitely take a look at that. And then the last piece is just, to, again, the ESSER um, component. And the only um, slide that I will stop on there um, is this one, which shows you uh, the plan over the next four years of how we're going to spend the money. And um, if you look at the, uh, the $7.6 million um, that's in the 22-23 column, um, you should find the same $7.6 million on the expense side of the budget, the whole way at the bottom, um, under... Um, under reserves, and the, obviously the other 851,000 is within the budget, so it's a little bit harder to see, uh, but those numbers should match and, and kind of give you an, an idea of how that um, that money, so if you see, you know, why did, why did the budget go up so much in an expense from last year to this year? It's because we've got a bulk of our, our spending um, in that year, and if Dr. Z would just go to the last slide, the reason we're doing that is because you know, where the timeline. So, you know, one major timeline ending this September, and then that's for the smallest ESSER piece. We've already spent that. That's not an issue. But the two larger pieces are rolling off in 23 and 24. So 
you know, we were trying to build as much into next year's budget as we could uh, in order to give ourselves maximum flexibility that if we got behind on anything, we could go into 2024 and not run up against the deadline. That's it. That's all I have. Thank you. So from a process standpoint, the next meeting, we'll vote on the preliminary budget. It'll be a roll call, and that'll be something that they could take and they could post and do their thing with it as we finalize it up. For uh, for the final budget vote, just yeah, timeline. We'll do the same exercise in June. If there are any changes, we'll come back and we'll show you what the changes are. And you usually not. It's not very much. If we go through this, right? <laughs> normally there aren't quite as many changes. I know it feels probably feels like we go through it a couple of times, but we sort of whittle it away as we go through each month. This is where the rubber hits the road. This it does. Is the reality. It yeah. does. I have always appreciated our ability to stay at the bottom of that list, mm -hmm. but when you're writing your check, your taxes, you don't you think are. about that. But a couple of things, too, is that 80% of your budget, you almost can't touch. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, at least. It, you know, and you don't want to, if you go with the minimum, you're not even going to make that. So the more you go in a hold every year, it's just going to take you longer to dig out. That's why we've been very careful about yeah. not getting into well, a There's no way we can hole. control that change. Yeah. I mean, the state legislature can make a change there, but uh, we went through a 10-year period. We literally doubled property taxes, and we will do that again. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's for a good cause. Oh, uh, no doubt. <laughs> well, for kids. No doubt. It's for the kids. No doubt. So, well, right. you. well, if you think of anything, you know, certainly yeah, reach out the next week and we'll We'll get it together for you. Okay, Dr. Zukowski, uh, do you have an updated Lancaster County Academy budget? We do. It's posted. Okay. It's for 22-23. Um, they're looking at a 1.9% increase for the slots. Yeah. Not the, but for a slot that you can put a student in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have 11 slots that we contract out with them. And... Uh, Dr. McFadden did a great job at our board Good. retreat explaining LCA. Good. Well, what I did not have is when the, the, the board, when the uh, Joint Operating Committee was presented its budget, we made a change in salary. And yeah, I, yeah. I do not have any update. So you're looking that. at a salary increase of 2.5%. Uh, that wasn't everything. That's we, been updated since then? Mm hmm. Okay. Okay, so I, I'm, not sure, we'll I'm not sure then. how they're going to incorporate that into the budget, if, if it's uh, Dr. McFadden's salary. Okay. And we changed that, so I don't know how that affected the budget. I don't think it had a, a big impact, but I haven't seen those numbers. Um, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we won't put this on consent next week. Normally we would consent, and we'll just double-check mm -hmm. the numbers. Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't, if the numbers are as presented, they'll be on consent. Okay. No, if they're different, we'll pull it and make it an action discussion item. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Policy review. Yep. You and uh, Katie Meyer. Are going yep. To Katie's going to start off with the the news one of nine eleven. And I will say that in, in talking with Katie, we, we both found the same thing. Our policies are about six years old. That's just more the language. The content stays the same, but it's, it's reformatted better. Um, PSBA has sent down a, a more comprehensive look at, at how the policy should read. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, like Dr. Z was saying, is, is a lot of just reworking, not necessarily inaccurate, but just outdated language. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it certainly does not belong in there anymore, and you can see that with the red deletions. Um, a lot of this was taken off... Um, local districts that have updated their policies more recently than we have. Um, the one thing that I noticed, um, the big thing we took out was that the principal of each school will be responsible for maintaining li liaison with the media. That doesn't happen here, nor should it be in our policy. So that's just ha not how we operate. We don't have the principals do that, so that was taken out. Um, everything else was kind of in line of what we do, but just now in writing the responsibilities of the chief of communications. Um, it was pretty standard updating. Things we currently already do, we just want it in writing. Mm -hmm. There's a line in there that talks about uh, the communication rep. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have no idea who or what that is. Well, it says, so the chief communications rep is the board or his designee. So normally that would be Dr. Z. <coughs> okay. If he needs me to step in for him for a certain matter, that would be his designee then. And where did I, where did I miss that line? 
that is in now called Delegation of Responsibility, which was previously 911 300. 911 300. We just added or his or her designee to the end of that or sentence. Says the communi chief communication representative for the, oh, oh is it? Yep. Okay. That is the line I missed. And a lot of those numbers one through six don't apply yeah. to Dr. Z, they apply to me. Um, but between the two of us, we will cover those responsibilities. Okay, I get it. A lot of schools don't have a communications or public relations um, director, which is why a lot of them don't include the guidelines for staff members. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a legal review of that. Did we get a lot of limit that speech? That's been in the policy, so I don't know if we've had it legally reviewed. It's that we didn't change. That's been in there I since mean, the beginning. I mean, some staff members are not allowed to give interviews. Are we allowed to do that? They are not. If they are speaking to the media as a representative of CVEA, they are allowed to speak. They are not allowed to speak as on behalf of the school district itself. No, on behalf of Correct. the school district. Yep. Um, it doesn't say that. No, except they should run without prior prior. Yeah, approval. but I mean, I, I'm sure that's what's understood. Yep. But that's not what it says. It says they yeah, shouldn't give interviews on behalf of the school, okay. of the district. Because yep. okay. the way it reads, you're not allowed to give interviews. Yep. And I don't think we can do that. And that, that's uh, a web I would want to get caught in. Okay. Yeah. Easy enough. Just make it more clear. Yeah, I think so. Are you going to the next one? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. 9-12, um, it's really cleaning it up because, where am I? The educational institutions. The out-of-district placements and the community, that's more of a um, administrative regulation that it falls under there. How we should do it, make available the facilities. That's a, a 707 policy. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of keep it simple, mm -hmm. it is the reason we went with the, the PSBA and the one that's been adopted by other districts. Mm -hmm. Everything else has been picked up in other policies. Yeah, and that was my question. All that stuff shows up elsewhere. Correct. And you'll see the same thing in, in 913. We'll see where we're deleting our existing one because it talks about PTOs and um, booster clubs. We're, we already address all that in yeah. other policies. So this is truly for non-school organizations not connected with, with the school. Uh, did we consider uh, accommodating Market Street Sports in this? We'll find out where they fit. I'll get back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. And then relations with the intermediate unit, again, a lot of unnecessary language. Um, it's just cleaner the way that. Yeah. Is, is that. Is that a legal requirement that we have this policy, this particular policy? Because we have other, I mean, we've got the academy, we've got the CTC, or they? And are you specific? Yeah. I would not be surprised if somewhere when they established the IUs that they put this policy in and didn't address it for the others. I'll find out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's it for, for policy review. Okay. And the last, uh, Dr. Mann? Yep. Virtual Learning Program? Good evening. Uh, hopefully you can make this rather quick. We've been using uh, K-12 solutions at the elementary level for our virtual academy for since probably 2010. Um, and we've been using Odysseyware as a virtual solution from grade 7 to 12 for about the same amount of time. And over the years, um, we've had a pretty good um, contract with both of those companies. Um, and every year, the IU of it had asked us, 
if we wanted to join their their solution. Um, and every year we've looked at it and they couldn't compete with the numbers that we had you know, as far as the contract that we've had with those two companies. Well, they finally are able to compete with those companies. In fact, those two companies are now underneath them. And so they they now are able to negotiate a better deal than I am. Um, so it's taken them 10 years to get to me, but they finally they, they finally done it, which is which is great because now we're not on an island by ourselves. We're able to work with other districts. And, and um, as an example of that, uh, Mel Upton has been attending what's called their Rich Virtual Forum, which is a monthly meeting of like Java Group. So we're meeting with other districts, you know, and sharing ideas and things like that. It's, it's, it's an example of one benefit of doing this. But we um, will end up saving money because um, they, they did negotiate better contracts with K-12 as well as with Odyssey Wear. Now, interesting note, side note, is with the IU, one of the benefits of the IU, they use a platform called Genius, which is a single sign-on um, gateway. So we, we use that to log into K-12 um, or use it to log into Odysseyware. Uh, the IU also has other programs on the backside that we could take advantage of if we need to, because um, there is talk that Odysseyware is being bought out by some other company and being gobbled up, yes. being morphed into something else. So, you know, it's always a, a shifting landscape. So, um, I'm recommending that we do this year uh, sign on to the IU, and and what that means is we would be accessing K-12 and Odysseyware for now through their platform, and the, the contract would be with them rather than with those individual companies. I noticed in the contract it talks about um, a kind of census number to d determine your charges, and it was left blank, but that being filled in by next week. Yeah. And the same with, I uh, talked about optional support services. No, we're checked. Are we not taking any of We're not, no. Okay. And that's what's kind of nice about it is that if we need those services, we could opt for them, but we don't oh, need okay. that. We're managing all that internally, so we don't need their support there. Okay, any questions? That'll be on consent next week. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Next is a review of uh, next week's tentative agenda. Anyone have any questions or concerns on the agenda at this point? If not, this is another place in the meeting for anyone to address the board. Is there anyone who would like to speak? If not, uh, any board initiatives or announcements? Uh, I will tell you that I have asked uh, the Vice President to uh, take a couple of you and become an advisory group, uh, basically recommending what we do about Treasurer and Secretary elections. So I don't know who he's going to do. It'll take you probably about 30 seconds to make that decision, and then we'll move on. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? We have to elect the secretary and the treasurer for the board. Okay. Okay. Right. And that used to be a board member, but now that we're a second class uh, district, uh, it can't be a board member. So currently we are, and our policy allows us, but not demand, that we use the uh, chief financial officer as our, as our treasurer and uh, Mrs. Martin as our uh, secretary. Right. You can choose to continue that or to change it, and we're just asking them to tell us which they want to do. Right. Okay? I thought you were saying he's putting a committee together? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. A 30 second That's, committee. Technically, right. you have to have a committee. committee. Yeah, well, I'm committee. committee. Yeah. I, 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 I gotcha. tend not to call it committee because there are rules regulating open committee meetings. So I'm on the same page. It's now. sort of an advisory group to let <coughs> us know what, you know, they pulled a couple people from the board and agreed that they recommend we do one thing or the other. Right. Gotcha. It's, it's procedural. Yes. Right. Just one thing I, I did do, I should probably should mention it, went to the middle school concert, which is awesome. Yes. The uh, choir and orchestra and. Uh, and band, it's great to see musical instruments and kids, <laughs> yeah. and, and especially with all the crazy that's going on, and how much we invest in that. But it was real interesting in, in the high school, because when you look at the high school seniors, Mrs. Sheffer had the, those kids in orchestra since third grade, oh, wow. and now they're and now they're graduating. So that was really kind of neat to to see that hot cross buns to you know Mozart <laughs> is, is what they're doing. So it was, it's impressive the music program. Oh, here. and I like and I like investing in that well rounded. Educational. Well, and that paid off. If you remember last month, we were recognized as one of the best school districts for music education. Yeah. Yep. It's awesome. So, that's cool stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. 
If not, I will entertain a motion to uh, adjourn to executive session for legal and personnel reasons. Senator. Second. And everyone out there should feel sorry for us because we have another agenda almost this long looking at us. Okay. I said we have another agenda oh, that's fine. almost this long looking at us. Uh, all those in favor of the German motion? Aye. Opposed or abstained? We are.